So we got some various uh, stuff here. I'm sorry, I couldn't print it in color. I think it was readable enough in black and white. Right? Um, but we'll have nice colors here. We have to take some measurements. I didn't really tell you much about the units other than on one or two of these, so um, not too worried about that. Now for this first one, it's a graduated cylinder. I guess we can assume it's milliliters, but it could be a really big graduated cylinder. It'd be liters or whatever. Um, the important thing is that you get the number with the correct number of significant figures. Uh, so in this case, we again use our same technique where we find the numbers that we're sure about and then one estimated digit. In this case, we know it has to be bigger than three and bigger than the second one. So it's got to be 3.2 something. Whatever that something is, is up to you. So, you know, to me on my screen, it looks about halfway. So I'm going to say 3.25. If you said, wait a second, no, I'm, I'm wrong about that. You're right, you're right. Sorry. Not two. That's actually, this is like our, our graduated cylinders in the lab, right? So that's a little bit bigger than the fourth one. Um, so you might call that, in fact, I would say it's even a little bit closer to six. I would call it something like maybe 3.5. Five, something like that. If you said 3.50 or 3.4 something, that's fine. 3.57? Yeah, sure. Yeah. When, when the um, scale is every two, then instead of being plus or minus one, it's really probably like plus or minus two or more. So um, anything that you put in there that was something around 3.5 something should be fine. As long as, but you should definitely have the three significant figures. All right, um, on to B, the next one. This is a ruler in inches. We usually don't measure stuff in inches in lab, but you know, same technique, same same idea. Why not? This green bar here clearly spans from the zero on the ruler to the one. So I would say that's right on there. Um, but now the question is, how many decimal places do we put? We see here that this is divided into tenths. So that means that if it were, let's say, a little bit shorter than this, if, if instead we were looking like over here, then we'd know it was definitely more than 0.9, and our estimated digit would be after the 0.9, so 0.94 or something if it were over there. That means we must always use two decimal places with this one as well. So this should be 1.00 inch. If you said 0.99 because you thought it was a little bit under or 0.98, that's fine also. Um, but it's important that you have the two decimal places for that. Um, note also, this is not usually how we measure things in inches. Um, if those of you are familiar with standard inch rulers, usually an inch is split into eighths of an inch or sixteenths of an inch. Um, in this particular case, it is tenths, just like a metric ruler, so that's why I used it. Okay, now we have a burette. So the scale is going backwards. Um, starting at zero on the top, but we still read it the same way. We see that measurement as being between zero and one, so it is zero for sure. <coughs> then I would say it looks like it is right on that uh, sixth little line down right here. So that would be 0 0.60. And this one is in ML, but as long as you have the number, that's okay. In general, anytime you have um, gradations of 10 or 5 between two whole numbers, that's going to give you two decimal places. The last one, the balance, um, this one is not something that we're reading on a particular scale, but we take balance measurements all the time. So I just wanted to kind of confirm that those numbers are actually important, uh, 0 0.15. Zero, two. And I think that says grams. I don't know if that was readable on the quiz, but something like that, grams. Um, the point of this question was, this is a common thing that I see when I'm creating the labs, um, that sometimes people like to abbreviate the reading from the balance. But whatever tool you're using, however many decimal places it gives you, make sure to use all of those decimal places. Always write them all down in your notebook. When you do the calculations, then you can round up as necessary. But when, um, when you first take the measurement, always use all the decimal places. Don't round off. 
The uncertainty, by the way, is built into the instrument in this case. So a digital balance like that, that last digit is plus or minus one in the instrument. So just write all those numbers and you're fine. So good. These will keep coming up. You'll probably have a question like this on exams, each exam. Um, and of course, every day in lab when we make measurements, we have to make sure to make the correct measurements. So keep looking at that. All right, the rest of it was some uh, conversion problems, as promised. Package of chocolate pudding contains, these are all from the book, by the way, um, contains 2,840 milligrams of sodium. How many grams of sodium is that? So we're going to go milligrams to grams. That means we want to get rid of milligrams and end up with grams. 1,000 milligrams per gram. Well, those 2.840 grams. If you rounded that off to 2.84 or 2.8, that's fine. All right, during surgery, a patient receives 5.0 pints of plasma. How many milliliters of plasma were given? So we want to go pints to milliliters somehow. Um, I don't know how many milliliters are in a pint. Maybe you do. Uh, but we have these handy conversion factors to help us. Um, we can ignore that first one. That doesn't have anything to do with this. But the one liter is 1.06 quarts, and two pints <coughs> is a quart. So that means we have a little path here from pints to quarts to liters, and then we can go to milliliters from liters because um, we know that one. So we can fill the rest of this in by going pints to quarts, to liters, and then to milliliters. So let's set that up. Five pints. So we can go pints to quarts, quarts to liters, in liters to milliliters, and that will give us something in milliliters. When I do this, by the way, I usually do it like this, where I set up with all the units before I even put the numbers in. Um, that way I know that my plan is set up properly, I know the units are canceling as they're supposed to, and then I just need to put the numbers in just as they are in the equation. So the equation down here says two pints to one quart, <coughs> So I put the two by the pints and one by quarts. Then quarts to liters, 1.06 quarts to <coughs> one liters. 1.06 quarts to one liters. There we go. And then finally, 1,000 milliliters to a liter. Good. All right. So then we calculate it out, and that's the answer. Um, let's do that. Five divided by 2, divided by 1.06, times 1,000, 2,358 milliliters. All right? OK, great. Finally, a density problem. Graduated cylinder with 18 milliliters of water. What is the new water level? after this, this silver metal is submerged in the water. In this case, we want to know how much space does that silver take up? Because when we put it in the water, the water will move up that much. Um, sometimes questions like this, it could be helpful to draw yourself a little picture. Um, here's our graduated cylinder. Right now, our liquid level is here. 
So we're going to put in some silver, some chunk of silver. We don't really know how much that is, but 35 grams, you know, it's probably some little bit. Drop that in there. This will go down to the bottom. And the water level will then go up a certain amount. We don't know how much, but it'll go up some amount. So um, that's a good way to think about it because we know if our answer makes sense or not. If we get an answer that is lower than 18 milliliters, then we did something wrong, um, and so on, like we've talked about before. So first we need to figure out how much space 35.6 grams of silver metal takes up, which is a conversion of a sort of going from grams to milliliters. We use the density for that. So 35.6 grams of silver and we want to get rid of grams and instead have milliliters. So we use that density, which tells us there's 10.5 grams in each milliliter of silver. 35.6 divided by 10.5, 3.39. So that tells us that this silver takes up 3.39 milliliters of space. That's the volume of the silver. So the final level will be 18 plus 3.39 as the silver is added to it, which is 21.4. We'll stick with our three um, significant figures, 21.4 milliliters. 21.3. So that should be the new water level after that silver goes down and pushes the rest of the water up. Good? All right, uh, I will grade these quizzes and get them back to you. So moving on, let's recall what we were talking about when we left last time. Uh, some temperature conversions. So we looked at converting among the three different temperature scales. Um, make sure you're Excuse me, somewhat um, familiar with this and, and confident in going back and forth. Again, you don't need to know the equations, um, but you do need to know how to use them. The next part of this is to talk about a little bit about heat and heating curves and how we use energy to heat up a substance like water and what happens when we do that. Um, so we need to know some units, and if you were looking at some of the the, the old practice quiz that's on Blackboard from a previous semester, uh, you'll find some energy question on there because we did it later in the semester back then. That uses some of these units of energy that we need to know. So we talked about that a degree in temperature or a Kelvin is not a unit of energy. Temperature is not the same as energy. Um, energy can cause a ch change in temperature, but temperature is not the same as energy. So what are units of energy? Anybody know? What's a unit that measures energy? Yeah. Those aren't. Those, are, those measure temperature. So what measures energy? A joule is one. Yep. Which is abbreviated capital J. A calorie. CAL. Those are the two that are most important that we will use um, primarily in this class. Uh, there are some other units that you may or may not have heard of um, that, that are used in to measure energy. Anybody know? Any other? Um, a common one in outside of science is the BTU especially when we talk about things like fuels, stands for British Thermal Unit. Um, and it has to do with heating a pound, how much energy it takes to heat a pound of water. Uh, that's, so that's sort of like the English system or the imperial system's equivalent of an energy unit. You might see BTU on things like um, furnaces and air conditioners, a measure of how much energy they use um, to put, to cool a certain amount of space. They um, You'll also see this in terms of comparing fuels, like if you want to know if gasoline is more energy dense than diesel, that kind of a thing, comparing to renewable or alternative fuels. 
So you might see BTUs in that as well. Uh, but the two that we're going to focus on here are the joule and the calorie. The joule is the um, is a smaller unit, and we won't really talk too much about that other than using it in some conversions. But the calorie has an interesting definition, and, and this is a definition that we should know. It takes one calorie of energy to raise one gram of water, one degree C, or one Kelvin. So you have exactly one gram of water, which is also one milliliter. If you want to raise that milliliter from, let's say, 23 degrees in temperature to 24 degrees, that would take one calorie of energy. And that's how that unit is defined. Um, this is also known as the specific heat or the heat capacity. So the specific heat is kind of turning it around the other way, talking about the material. Specific heat is how much energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance, one degree C. So for water, the specific heat is one. It takes one calorie to raise one gram of substance, one degree C. So what, what could you give me an uh, uh, example of another material, not water, that either has a higher or a lower specific heat? So think about what that means. You put a certain amount of energy in, <laughs> you raise that material a certain Degree, number of degrees in temperature. So water, for instance, has one, it takes one calorie to do that. Can you think of a substance that might have a lower specific heat, where it takes less energy to raise it that same amount of temperature? Metal? Metal, yeah. Why? Or how, how, do you, how do you know that? Because you have no transfer. Yeah, because it's like easier to heat up metal, right? If you're boiling water on the stove, if you just put a pan on there and you turn up the heat, that pan gets hot really fast, right? But if it's full of water, it doesn't get, that water doesn't get hot quite as quickly. And that's because it takes more energy to raise that water than, than that substance. And in fact, that is something that's special about water, that most other substances um, don't have a, as high of a specific heat, not even close in a lot of cases. Um, take a look at this <coughs> table from the book. Um, if I can find it. We're going a little out of order here, so I didn't have it pulled up right. There we go. So here's specific heats for some substances. I'll copy this into the notes. So take a look at some of these substances. Focus right up now on the column in the middle, the calories. The other one is joules. So you can see water down here, liquid water. Uh, one has a specific heat of one calorie per gram degree C, which means it takes one calorie to raise a gram of water one degree C. Um, and then look at the metals up on the top, the top half of the, of the sheet there, or of the table. Those numbers are all much, much, much lower, which means that it takes a whole lot less energy to heat up a gram of, say, silver one degree C than water. 
a tiny fraction of the energy it takes to heat up water, you can heat up silver with. And same with most of those other metals as well. Even solid water, ice, it takes less energy to heat it up by the same amount of temperature than liquid water. So liquid water is pretty special in its really high specific heat. All right. So that said, have you had you heard about this unit, you know, the calorie, before? Before we start talking about it, people heard of that calories in like food. Yeah, um, that is actually a little bit of a problem because it's not the same unit. I'll put it in red here. Whoops. If you look at a food container and you look at the calories here, <laughs> so in one bottle of this uh, soda, this out of focus soda, we've got 250 calories. See that? However, Notice that calorie has a capital C. You wouldn't think that was an important distinction. It's actually hugely important. Um, the food calorie, the capital C calorie, is 1,000 of the little c calories. So that calorie in our food is actually a measure of how much energy it takes to heat up a kilogram of water, not a gram of water. Another way that we talk about this, or another way we can express that unit, is to call this a kilocalorie or a kcal. And I think in most places outside the US, that is how the nutrition label is written. It says, when it says the number, it says kcal instead of capital C calorie. It's especially confusing because as we can see, C is one of those letters in English where the capital and the lowercase one look the same. So if you just write your C a little too big or a little too small, suddenly you're off by a thousand. So in this class, we're not, other than when we're actually reading food labels, we're not going to use this big C calorie because that's kind of confusing. We're going to talk about the little C calorie or we're going to talk about the K cal if we, want, if we, if we care about a thousand of them. Um, so keep that in mind when you actually are reading food labels, like in lab next week, when you're asked to calculate the energies in some different foods, um, that the calories on the label is actually kilocalories, so 1,000 calories. All right. Oh, yeah. And so joules, I didn't really talk about joules. Um, joules is just another measure of energy. So we're going to be able to do a conversion with them. As with any of these other conversions, um, you know, you'll have to know that you don't have to know that number, I don't think. Um, but one calorie is 4.184 joules. So if we want if we have something in calories and we want to know how many joules it is, we could set up a conversion and we multiply by 4.184 and we've got joules. Um, joules is more commonly used in scientific contexts. It's a smaller unit, and um, it's more it's it's more closely related with other um, metric units like the kilogram and the meter and stuff like that. So, um, so we'll often use joules in other types of scientific calculations, or we're talking about stabilities of molecules and that kind of stuff. Um, when we talk about food and measuring heat, we often talk about it in terms of calories. But now you're all unit conversion experts, so should be fine, right? Everybody's good? Yeah. We can also talk about something called energy density. Um, energy density is the amount of energy in a given amount of substance.
And that given amount of substance can either be a mass or it could be a volume, depending on what we're looking at. Um, so we might have things like kilojoules per gram. So how many kilojoules are in a gram of this compound of potential energy? So if we're looking at like um, food, for instance, we want really energy dense food. Um, of the three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat, which do you think is the most energy dense? Which has the most energy per unit of mass? In that case, we'd usually look at the calories per gram or the kilocalories per gram. Which one do you think is the most energy dense? I just realized when I said that that I don't actually know that. No, it's, it's not carbohydrates. What's your second guess? But fat, yeah, fat is the most energy dense of the macronutrients, which means it stores the most energy. So one gram of fat will have more energy in it, potential energy that you can use, than one gram of carbohydrate or one gram of protein. The actual numbers for that are as follows. Fats, and again, this is averages. There's different types of fats. There's different types of things. But as a broad category on average, fats have 9 kilocalories per gram. Carbohydrates have, on average, 4 kilocalories per gram. And protein has, on average, four kilocalories per gram. Does anybody have any snacks that might have a label that we could look at? Do you have M&M's? Do you mind if we take a look at them? Just the wrapper. I'm not going to steal your M&M's. No, I finished it alone. Oh, OK. Great, thanks, Doug. So let's take a look at this wrapper. Um, were, they, were they good? Yeah. And let's just, let's see what kind of numbers we have here. If we can get to focus. A little more light. Nothing? Why doesn't it want to? It's like it's getting close, but it just won't focus quite enough. All right, well, I guess I'll just tell you what it says then. Close when we do it. It's like almost worse. All right. Well, anyway, um, I guess we should put it in the notes anyway. So the M and M's. This package, I can read on the front, um, and it tells us that the weight is one point. Seven four ounces, or forty nine point three grams. The calories, and that's big C calories, which we know is actually kcals, is two hundred and fifty. And then we can also find the um, individual macronutrients. So we've got 30 grams of carbohydrates, um, 13 grams of fat, 
and five grams of protein. All right, so that's our M&Ms. Um, now looking at these numbers for carbohydrates, fat, and protein, we should be able to multiply it by each of their energy densities and come up with the same overall calories, okay, calories. So um, 40 grams of carbohydrates is going to be times 4 calories per gram. Grams cancel, and we end up with 120 Oops, that's kcals. 120 kcals. 13 grams of fat times 9 kcals per gram is um, 117 kcals. And then 5 grams of protein times 4 kcals per gram is 20 kcals. We add that all up, and you get 257 kcals. Which is close to the 200 that are reported. Why is it a little bit more? Um, it could be because of rounding error issues. Or because um, some parts of it are a little bit more energy dense in terms of they don't fit exactly the averages. But that should that that's basically correct, I guess, within a factor of error. Um, if you notice, the calories are reported as 250, and given our significant figures, that final zero is not significant. So that means that when they report 250 calories, they're really saying between 240 and 260, and that's what we see here also. They also, by the way, report fat calories as 120, so within, the mar within you know, two significant figures, that's what we find as well, about 120 um, calories from fat. So if you think maybe the math is ever done wrong on those packages, you can check this out yourself and see it. So that's how energy density works in terms of food. There's also energy density in terms of fuels. Um, I want to pull up this question from the exam um, a couple of years ago. This question was a little too hard for this exam, so I haven't asked it since, but um, it's a good review question. This is from the US Department of Energy. They're looking at a comparison of energy density of different fuels. Energy density is an extremely important measure when it comes to fuel, because especially in something like transportation, you need to be able to transport that fuel in the same vehicle that's actually using it. And so something that is very energy dense means it supplies a lot of energy for how much space it takes up. Something that is not very energy dense doesn't supply a lot of energy for the amount of space um, that it takes up. And so um, that's been one of the big struggling points of renewable energy and uh, other types of more um, environmentally friendly energies is they just don't have the same kind of energy density as traditional fossil fuels. So if you look here, this is measured in 1,000 BTU per cubic foot. That's a pretty weird measure, not one that we would normally use in a class like this. So this is 1,000 BTU for every cubic foot. A cubic foot 
you know, it's like a foot that's a, or a cube that's a foot on each side. Um, and so uh, that is an energy density per volume. So a better unit for us might be something like calories per milliliter, that kind of a thing. Um, in fact, the question on this exam was specifically asking, convert this to a friendlier number, um, kcals per liter. So a cubic foot is big, it's 28 liters, um, and so you can convert from there. But I want you to just take a look at this chart and at these different uh, fuels. So you see diesel fuel um, compared to gasoline, about the same, so about 1,000 a 1, BTUs, so a million BTUs per cubic foot. That's how much energy is produced by this much of the fuel. If you go down to some of the more um, kind of emergent alternative fuels, things like liquid hydrogen, right, super tiny. And think about batteries. These are the best batteries that we can possibly have. And the energy density for the amount of space that those batteries take up um, is so much smaller, almost 10 times smaller. And that's really one of the biggest drawbacks and the biggest challenges for um, electric cars is that it's just difficult to carry that much energy with you in your car compared to what we can carry in a gas tank. And so until those types of things can become more and more efficient, um, the previous generation nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries, which are kind of the old fashioned rechargeable batteries, you can still buy them um, a lot cheaper, but their energy density is tiny. You could never even expect to have a car go virtually anywhere with that kind of an energy density. And so all this other stuff in, in between. Liquid natural gas is a big um, replacer of gasoline right now because it comes, we can mine it domestically. So a lot of commercial trucks and things like that are switching to liquid natural gas. But still you're looking at about half the energy density. So you need to carry a whole lot more fuel with you to go the same amount of distance with some of these other um, types of fuels. So we can talk about energy density in terms of mass with food. We can talk about energy density in terms of volume uh, when we talk about energy. All right. So the last thing we have to talk about in this chapter is something called a heating curve. And you're going to do this on um, Wednesday in lab. A heating curve is a graph that shows you what happens to temperature when you add energy. Remember, energy and temperature is not the same thing, but adding energy as heat can change the temperature. <coughs> um, so let me flip back to the book here so I can pull out their nice um, chart. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. We know about some of the different phase changes of water, but I guess we should review that first. So take a look at this picture. Here are the three phases of water. I, I hope you know that water can have three phases. Water, or uh, liquid, solid, and gas. The solid we call ice. The gas we call water vapor. Here's a picture of it on the molecular level. Right? Solid water is all packed together in, in a rigid structure. Liquid water it has the free-floating molecules, but still pretty close together. And gas water, the water molecules are completely separate from each other, not interacting at all. So those, these things are going to happen. In other words, the, um, we're going to switch from one phase to another when we add heat to water. So let's look at, find that picture. Here we go. Okay. So this is an example of a heating curve. 
And you'll notice that the y-axis up and down is temperature, and the x-axis is heat absorbed. There's no units on the x-axis because it's actually not drawn to scale here, um, but we'll, we'll talk about those numbers in a little bit. So you start with solid water, ice, at minus 40 degrees C, and that's right over here. As we add energy, we warm that ice up. And remember, ice has a lower specific heat than liquid water. So that means it takes less energy to warm it up than it would for liquid water. That's why it's a, it's a pretty steep slope here. It's warming up really quickly. When it gets to zero, something interesting happens. We have to put in a bunch more energy, but it doesn't change its temperature. And so we call that melting. We have to put energy into that ice to get it to melt, but we do not change its temperature. Ice at, you can have ice at zero degrees, and you can have water at zero degrees, liquid water at zero degrees. To get between the two, you either have to put energy in to melt the ice or take energy out to freeze the ice. So does that mean that, so is melting an endothermic process or an exothermic process? What? Yeah, endo, because you're putting energy into the ice. So it's an endothermic process. It's taking energy out from, our, from the surrounding area to melt the ice. All right, then we have liquid water at zero degrees. We heat that up, keep heating it, keep heating it with more energy that we put in. And then we get to 100, and again, we have to put in a whole bunch more energy without changing the temperature of that water. And that's what we call boiling. So that's separating those water molecules from each other and forming water vapor. And when we form that water vapor, then we can heat that water vapor up further as much as we want to heat it up. But this is the idea of the heating curve, that we can see a few, some, some interesting information from this. Uh, first of all, if we know a certain um, plateau like this or like this, we can look at the phase changes. So we know what's happening. Are you switching from liquid to solid? We can look at the slopes of the lines. See, that one's really steep. This one's a little bit more shallow. And this one's steep again. That has to do with the specific heat. The steeper that line is, the lower the specific heat is, which means less energy can affect the same temperature change. Um, and this one's not exactly to scale, but it's pretty close. So the um, amount of energy that it takes to melt ice is called the heat of fusion, sometimes known as the heat of melting. And that is, uh, it's called fusion because of the backwards, like if you, if you freeze something, that's, called, that's known as fusion. But the heat of fusion of ice is 80, um, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, yeah. <laughs> 80 calories per gram, right, yeah. Which means for one gram of water, that same one gram, remember it took one calorie to raise it one degree C. It takes 80 calories to melt that ice, that gram of ice, without changing the temperature at all. So just to melt it takes 80 calories. And then this one, the heat of is called the heat of vaporization. And that's 540 calories per gram. Remember, one calorie to heat up a gram one degree C, 540 calories to chain to vaporize that water, to change that water from a liquid to a vapor. So that is a lot more energy. If this thing were to scale, then that line should really be even bigger than it is. It should be almost like seven times as big as the um, 80 calorie line, which I guess it's probably close. Um, this is why, for instance, when you're cooking, you know, has anybody here ever boiled a pot of water? 
You should try it. Just cook your own food. It's fine. You can do it. Um, but if you boil a pot of water, you'll notice that the water gets hot pretty fast. If you put a pot of water on the stove, you turn it on, it's not very long before you can't really stick your hand in it anymore. What, like a couple minutes maybe? But it takes quite a bit longer than that still to get it to boil. And that's because you have to put in a whole lot more energy to actually boil it than to just warm it up to the boiling temperature. Um, because of that really high heat of vaporization. All right, so we'll stop there. Um, next week, we will kind of look at some practice problems of how to do this. Start going into the homework, the chapter three homework. You should be able to do all of it at this point. Um, so you have, can come back with any questions. And then Wednesday, we're going to do a lab on this stuff and do some of these measurements ourselves with uh, boiling points of water and some other energy type calculations. So that should be fun. Other things, uh, make sure that you're ready for lab on Wednesday, so you do the pre-lab activity and you've got your instructions. And then if you haven't already, please finish up the um, web form for the questions from last week's lab. And as long as those are done before lab on Wednesday, then I'll grade them after that. Have a good weekend.